Welcome back. Uh, it's still March the 13th. I want to thank again the volunteer crew and Shaw staff. My guest in this segment is John Farquharson. We're going to be talking about local issues. So we've got a sort of list and well, local and national. Yeah, right. Local and national. Um, so one of our city councillors, Laurel Collins, is um, throwing her hat into the ring to run uh, as to get the nomination yep. from the NDP to run federally. Yeah. And, uh, Since the NDP, Marie Rankin, has decided not to run again, yes. so the, the seat is open to a new, a new candidate. And uh, I, you know, I got her a Facebook comment from her about this, and there was a lot of support from different people saying, yeah, go, go Laurel. I personally didn't like it. Because? Because uh, I think when you just run for and won a seat on Victoria City Council, you owe a little more time than that to the people who voted for you instead of to move on to a different and better job. Now, that's how I see it. I'm not saying I'm right, but that's how I see it. Yeah, I come at it from a sort of a door knocking perspective. So I've knocked on a lot of doors for different, uh, for different candidates, uh, nationally, provincially, and uh, civic. And uh, personally, um, I know that if I'd gone out and invested a lot of time, a lot of energy in knocking on doors, thinking that this person was going to you know, be here for the duration and was really committed to doing things for the city, and then to find out later that, whew, you know, she's uh, seen bigger opportunity and she's out of here, I'd be cranky. <laughs> I, would, I would be disappointed. But some would, that's some just might me. Not some might not be. So I've heard that, you know, she's gotten tons of support. That's, again, my perspective as a door knocker. In terms of uh, both city government and federal government, uh, the underlying problem is, is that none of them seem to care <laughs> what the public thinks or feels. That's, that's my take on it. Maybe, maybe I'm not right, but I get the feeling that our, even our city government, that we're so close to, I mean, we know these people in many cases, uh, they seem to be on a different planet. They're making decisions that they tell us about, they don't ask us about, do we want it, do we not want it, who Is cares? That on our list? <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Cherry trees. Cherry trees. It you know, it ties into the local civic government. Again, I, I, you know, blasted off this list here. I was just curious about your opinion on uh, the uh, the policy that apparently had been in place to reduce. Um, I'm sorry, to replace any uh, uh, non-indigenous trees, such as cherry trees, with indigenous trees uh, uh, once if if they died. And then there was a, and then that was apparently the policy. And then, I never knew about it. Yeah. And then there was a, you know, the chair, some of the some of the cherry trees were being replaced. And then there was um, sort of a retake on, you know, having a look at that. And uh, one of the uh, claims was that, well, the cherry trees were dying of, of, uh, because of climate change. They couldn't live in this environment. And lo and behold, when a, you know, a biology forestry prof was you know, consulted up at UVic, it says, no, no, they're not dying because of climate change. They're dying because they're old. And they have a very good resilience to all sorts of you know, climates in, in, uh, in Asia. So uh, what, I'm, what, what I was taken with is the, um, is the certainty on behalf of you know, some politicians that this was all due to climate change, and lo and behold, it isn't. It's just simply due to old age. So I uh, just uh, threw that out for your consideration in terms of topics, but we can move along. Well, uh, personally, I like the cherry trees. I do too, and uh, they have cultural value. Yeah, and I think I if deci these decisions are made, somehow the public should be involved in making or at least knowing about these decisions so we have some idea of what's going on in our city. But they did, you know, in the sense, what I liked about it is that the, it, uh, one of the councillors brought it to, you know, questioned it. Right? He just didn't say, oh, climate change, and then, okay, that's, uh, uh, then I'm just going to go along with it. He questioned it, and he said, okay, let's, let's look at all the variables here. And that was you know, Jeff Young. He questioned it. And then other people, members of the public, uh, paid attention, and they got involved, gave their two cents worth, and lo and behold, um, you know, there, was, there, there was some public input. So things did get changed. So that was good to see. Okay. Uh, next on the list, uh, mayor, our city mayor here in Victoria, Lisa Helps, goes to Alberta. With an open mind? I didn't even know she went. 
Oh, well, no, wait, wait. I, it, has she gone, or is that... I'm not sure if she has, or she's in sometime this month. Right, and the idea was because Victoria is uh, speaking out on climate change, she's been Victoria's, invited Victoria to Victoria, I think, has or is going to become party to a, a suit uh, against large oil companies um, uh, because of climate change, right, for contributing to climate change, because their product contributes, when it's used, contributes part to... Part of a lawsuit. Uh, part of a lawsuit. And apparently, it was, there's other cities that have signed on. And um, didn't know that either. <laughs> well, this is going to be one-sided then, because uh, she wanted to go to uh, uh, to the oil sands, have a look at what they were doing, and she said she was going to go with an open mind. And I, you know, my question was, well, okay, you're part of a suit for uh, large oil companies that are, you know, taking, uh, you know, shipping Dilbit. Uh, so so I'm just questioning the open mind. Mm. That's that's the only thing I would throw up there in terms of. Yeah, I mean, t to me, the real issue is that everybody's future is in dire jeopardy. Yep. Why, instead of that being the story, the story is that we're fighting the people of Alberta. It's all everybody. It's all of us and all everybody's futures that are in jeopardy. I mean, I'm all for the people of Alberta. They're great people, you know, and they deserve good jobs like everybody else. But they can't be in that industry, and we should have started changing 20 years ago, but we didn't. But we didn't. And that's, I mean, that's the leadership of our country. You know, it's pathetic. <laughs> the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've talked about this on your show before, um, but uh, what was your take on what should have been done, what was done? Could it have been handled differently? What I thought was once a, a decision had to be made one way or the other, right, then I, I just got the feeling the media was going to use that decision one way or the other, no matter what they decided, to divide the city. And that's what I saw happen. I saw the media just create a real, uh, I mean, it went national, probably international. That's how big oh, yeah. the story became. It was big. Yeah. And, and I really wondered why. Why do they, does the media choose to put everything in this adversarial thing and have us fighting each other? Yeah, my take was a bit different. My take was I was really, di there was a, you know, there was this, I think it was called the city family, something like that. There was a, it was a committee and it met, I think, every week or so and uh, discussed various issues. But this was obviously a huge issue because apparently the city had been asked by leaders from a local First Nations to remove the statue because they didn't feel that they should be faced with, you know, the, uh, uh, with Sir John A. Macdonald, given his history with residential schools and so on. Uh, every time they wanted to do business at City Hall, local governance, local, you know, local government. So, um, you know, this, uh, apparently this uh, decision was made and then my big disappointment was that they did it in the middle of the night they did it, you know, uh, in, in, a le uh, in a less than transparent manner. And my approach, because I don't think they trusted the good city, uh, the good citizens of Victoria. If they trusted the good citizen, citizens of Victoria, I think that if they had said, here's the situation. We've been asked by local representatives to remove the statue. Here's why. I would suggest that probably 95% of Victorians would say, yeah, that's just not on. We have to, uh, you know, get rid of the statue from its permanent location, okay? And what we so did... So people would agree with moving it? I think... For that reason. I, yeah, that's how I would I think, think I, I would you feel. You know, I've lived here for a long time, and I find their, you know, pretty, citizens of Victoria have pretty big hearts. They get it. They get that, you know, uh, First Nations, you know, live in, you know, not the best of, situ in best of conditions. I think they would have gone with it. And we could have turned it into a celebration. We could have turned it into a night, uh, you know, a, a night of, uh, of uh, you know, music and dance and speeches, and everybody would have come out, we would have known about it ahead of time, it would have been publicized, there would have been a public invitation. Everybody turns out, it's a huge celebration. The crane comes in and lifts the guy away and everybody cheers, right? I think it would, what a missed opportunity, because they didn't trust, there was, there was a lack of trust in the citizens of uh, Victoria. That was my takeaway. Bike lanes. Uh, you mentioned the speeding up of construction. Well, apparently they're going to put another three hundred and fifty thousand dollars on top of uh, what they've already spent on, you know, speeding up the uh, 
uh, construction of uh, separated bike lanes uh, because as you know and as you just mentioned we have an existential crisis with climate change and uh, the sooner we act the better so they're going to like I say speed this process up. Um, I'm curious on two fronts. One is if these, I think these bike lanes are going to be just north of 10 million by the time we finish this, this phase. And I'm thinking if I had 10 million dollars uh, to do something with greenhouse gas emissions, is this, is this the best expenditure of my money? I don't know. Could we, take it, could we have taken that 10 million dollars and spent it in another way to uh, have a bigger impact on well, greenhouse for example, gas emissions? The bike lane on Fort, which caused huge controversy, as far as I know, I don't understand why it's not on view. One street over, which is a much, I mean, maybe there's a good reason, but I've never heard that reason. View is a street with much less traffic, very little retail. It's a wide street. You could very easily perhaps make it one way and you'd have half, a, you know, half the street for, for, I mean, maybe that makes no sense, but you know, it's, it's just not on. This happens, and if you don't like it, too bad. Yeah. I'm a, and know, I'm all for bike lanes. But well, I'm a bikes. cyclist, so I, you know, I cycle everywhere. I commute to work, all that. And um, Focus Magazine has got an interesting uh, Three uh, initiative. And what they're going to do is they're going to actually begin to do a, do, a, do a count at something like about 15 major intersections in Victoria to over a period of three years. Uh, in one in April, one in October, they're going to do it at, uh, at rush hour, uh, assuming that's when commuters come and go, and basically see, is there a, you know, a huge uptake in uh, you know, uh, uh, commuters using bicycles rather than cars. And I hope there is. I hope there is too, but it's going to be interesting to uh, see the count. Uh, Jody wilson Rabel. Uh, okay. How much time do we have? We have about two minutes. Two minutes. So what's your take on uh, Jody? My take on that entire story is what happened to me is exactly the way the government has run 365 days a year for the last 20 years. The Prime Minister runs everything and if you don't like it, you're out. I mean, that's just the way it goes, I think. And I don't know why the media chose at this moment to make this such a big story because, I mean, they've done many, 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 many horrible things through the last two or three administrations in exactly the same manner. If you don't like it, you're out of cabinet. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure so much that it was the media who made the decision. You know, Andrew Scheer sort of r ramped up the rhetoric with, you know, the uh, request that the Prime Minister resign. So, it, you know, they, they brought, they, they stirred it up, they brought a lot of attention to it. And, um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, interesting to see, uh, um, again, how it unfolds. Because I've knocked on doors for for, for the Liberals, right? So I'm invested in what happens here. And it's uh, certainly been an interesting roller coaster for people like myself and other people who have, uh, you know, supported the uh, federal Liberal Party. Yeah, I mean, to me, there's just something very, very wrong with our entire democracy. You know, essentially there is none. So whether it's Trudeau or Scheer or, uh, you know, whoever it is from the NDP, uh, I don't think it can change. You know, what we've got to do is get, get a system that's more democratic. And we can do that. There are concrete things we can do to get a more democratic system, which gives people more of a voice and the 1% less of a voice, but, uh, but we're not doing it. Last thing was changes to city election funding. Right, so the, the provincial government initiated changes to how municipal elections are funded. And one was that the, you're only allowed uh, to spend, you know, s uh, per population. You're only allowed to spend, you know, 50 cents or a dollar per person in the... Uh, and so it was interesting to see, though, that the restrictions only applied basically to the... The major restrictions applied to the actual campaign, which is only 30 days. But there were no restrictions on what you could spend in that year outside the campaign period. Interesting. And plus, uh, you know... Th oh. Word of time. John, thank you very, very much. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Morning.